What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. Today, I'm brewing up something that's perfect for this time of year. It's officially feeling like summer. It's like 80 degrees outside, nice beautiful sunny day, light breeze, a lot of people down by the beach. So one of the best things for that type of weather is an exceptionally refreshing beer, something like a Goza. I'm gonna be using Philly sour yeast for the very first time, which is probably the easiest way to make a decent tasting sour beer, um, as you don't really need to do anything other than throw the yeast into the batch. So that's pretty convenient. We're going to be playing around with that for the first time. And also I'm going to be making this a margarita themed gozes. It's going to have tons of lime and salt and a little bit of orange as well. So it should be really fun. I'm excited to try it out. So let's get to it. Goza is an interesting style of beer. It's actually very historical. Now, the style of Goza originated in the town of Goslar in Germany. Due to the mining operations around that area, the water that was in the city was particularly salty, very high in sodium in general. Um, and the brewers of this town basically had to make do with that and they created this salty sort of uh, sour type of beer called Goza. And it was a, basically a wheat beer. To complement this salt, they would add things like coriander and they would also acidify the beer quite a bit as well to kind of basically make it all work together in a nice refreshing package. And the, the style of beer became very famous and it caught on in popularity for a while. Around World War II though, like most German styles of beer, it kind of faded out a little bit as a result of the war and production of the beer was not really, you know, something that necessarily was prioritized both during and after the war. However, in modern craft beer brewing, it started to come back a little bit in its popularity. Now it's one of the most popular styles of a sour beer that you can find anywhere. They tend to be tart and not extremely sour, um, which actually makes them quite palatable and a good introduction to somebody to sour beers if they're not really a big fan of the styles. Before we jump into the recipe, I wanna give a big shout out to Northern Brewer for helping provide all of the ingredients for this batch of beer, with the exception of the limes and fruit and stuff that I just got at my local store, and also to Clawhammer Supply. They, they manufacture the system that I'm gonna be brewing this on. Today, that's gonna be the 10 gallon, 240 volt system. It's a great system. System, so I do recommend checking them out if you got some time. Goza is a pretty light uh, style of beer overall. It's designed to be dry and refreshing, but you also don't want it to necessarily be a very heavy, strong, alcoholic beer. So generally they're gonna top out around 5% ABV. I'm gonna be only using eight pounds of grain overall, and that's gonna be a 50-50 split between best malts, Pilsen malts, and Weirman Pale Wheat malt. This should get us a really nice pale beer. A little bit of cloudiness, a little bit of haziness in it is perfectly fine. Uh, so that'll be nice. The, the wheat's gonna add a little bit of puffiness to everything as well and uh, should make for a very refreshing character. Um, for the hops on this one, we really wanna go very, very light. Uh, so you don't wanna take away from the, the crisp sourness uh, that you're gonna get, the tartness that you're gonna get. Um, and you don't wanna take away from the saltiness by adding too many competing flavors in here. So um, I'm actually going to be keeping it quite light, but we're still gonna add a little bit of flavor. And the hop of choice for today um, is actually Motueka. So uh, because I wanna push that lime character, Motueka is a very lime heavy uh, hop um, in terms of its flavor. So I'm gonna be adding just a small amount of it, just a quarter ounce at 60 minutes to bitter. And then that should get us only about 11 IBUs. And then the other three quarters of an ounce is gonna go in at zero minutes. And I'm hoping that that will add to the lime character. There are some other ingredients and spices though that are gonna be going into this. Uh, so all of these are gonna go in at zero minutes just to minimize the amount of bitterness that we extract from the spices. So uh, firstly though, and most importantly, is sea salt. And I'm adding three quarters of an ounce of that or 21 grams of sea salt. If I added this to the water profile at the very beginning of the mash, this would add upwards of 250 parts per million of sodium, which is a lot. Um, and that is a method, but most people seem to recognize recommend adding it actually after your boil is complete, so not to mess with the pH of things. And I think that makes a lot of sense. So I'm gonna wait till zero minutes to add in all of my sea salt. Then I'm also adding in half an ounce of coriander, uh, as is tradition, and that should help actually uh, accentuate a little bit of that orange character. And then on top of that, we're adding the peel of five limes, going pretty heavy on this one, and the peel of one orange. So all of that is gonna go in at zero minutes. So at the end of the day, you got lime, you got salt, you got orange. That's classic margarita. For the water profile in this one, um, with the exception of course of the salt that I'm adding later on, this is going to be a very balanced profile and a light one. So I'm targeting a water profile of 69 parts per million of calcium, six parts per million of magnesium, zero parts per million of sodium until after the boil, in which case it's gonna be about 270 
and then 95 parts per million of chloride, 62 parts per million of sulfate, and zero parts per million of bicarbonate. In order to get that water profile, I'm starting out with eight gallons of spring water, and I'm gonna be adding to that two grams of gypsum, two grams of epsom, six grams of calcium chloride, and then of course, at the zero minute mark of the boil, 21 grams of salt, sodium chloride. Once again, I'm using spring water just because it's easier to buy, it's cheaper to buy, and for the most part, spring water has like five to 10 parts per million of every mineral. Um, it's not excessive, and it doesn't really seem to hurt uh, my brewing. I have not really found a big difference in beers that I've made with spring water versus distilled water, uh, even light ones like this one. So um, I'm pretty confident to just use spring water from here on out. For the mash on this one, we wanna get it very dry. It's gonna be a highly carbonated, very dry beer hopefully around like 10.06, 10.05, final gravity. And critical to get that is going to be a nice low mash temperature. About 148 Fahrenheit is gonna get the job done for about 60 minutes. And then lastly, for our yeast, we're gonna be using Lalamand Wild Brew Philly Sour. We'll talk more about that in the fermentation section. It's my first time using it, but as far as I can tell, it is basically a plug and play, drop your beer pH down to 3.5 or 3.8 kind of thing. It's gonna be a nice uh, experiment. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get brewing. So I added eight gallons of spring water to my 10 gallon 240 volt claw hammer supply system and started to heat that up to the target mash temperature of 148. As the water was heating up, I measured out all of my grain and milled it and also measured out my water salts and added those to the strike water with the exception of course of the actual sea salt I was gonna be adding it at the end. Once I reached that target mash temperature of 148 Fahrenheit, I doed in with the entire grist and was sure to break up any clumps uh, that I found. And then I let it rest for about 10 minutes before taking a pH measurement sample and finding the pH to be on target at 5.4, so no adjustment was needed for pH. I let the mash continue sitting for another 50 minutes until it had rested for a full hour. And then I raised it up to a mash out temperature of 170 Fahrenheit for a total of 15 minutes. Then I pulled out the grain basket and let that drain for another total 15 minutes. I also started to prematurely wrap up the temperature to close to a boil, just under a boil though, so I avoided a boil over. And then once that basket was done draining, I removed the basket and set the controller to maintain a full boil. Once I hit that 60 minute mark, I added in my bittering addition of a quarter ounce of Motueka and let the boil continue for 50 minutes. And at that 10 minute mark, I added in my yeast nutrient at 10 minutes. After that, I let the boil continue for another 10 minutes before adding a ton of stuff at zero minutes. So firstly, I added my three quarters of an ounce of Motueka, and then I added all of the additional stuff that makes a goza a goza. So first of all, three quarters of an ounce of sea salt going in at zero, and then I added in half an ounce of coriander, the peel of five limes, and one orange, all of this was added in a hop bag to prevent clogging, uh, and I let this basically steep in the wort as it was recirculating and cooling down to uh, the pitch temperature for Philly Sour. Once this reached the target pitch temperature, I recorded an OG that was exactly on target at 1040, and then went ahead and pitched my Philly Sour. So for the fermentation on this beer, um, what I'm doing, I'm using Philly Sour. This is far and away the easiest and most consistent way to make a decent sour beer. This is a very interesting strain of uh, regular brewer's yeasts that actually creates its own lactic acid during fermentation. The more sugar it has to ferment, the more lactic acid it produces. And it basically gets to a point where it bottoms out at a specific pH. And this results in a nice, clean, sour beer pretty much every single time. From what I understand, it's not necessarily as complex of a sourness though as you can get out of a kettle souring process or out of fermenting with a direct pitch of uh, actual bacterial blend. Obviously, the easiest way to do this is just to go with Philly Sour. There's no other real equivalent for that kind of yeast though. You can, of course, ferment this using the kettle souring method. If you're gonna kettle sour, that process is a bit more complex. I plan on doing a video in the future showing on how to kettle sour. Uh, and I kind of wanna take this sour uh, beer trend that I'm kind of coming into right now and uh, 
progressively get a bit more complex in each brew. So starting with a Philly Sour, then going to a Kettle Sour, then doing a traditional bacterial blend. And we'll see how all that works. It, really though, if you're using Philly Sour, the process could not be easier. Technically, you can add lactic acid directly into a fully fermented beer to get the souring effect, but that's not the preferred way to do it. And trust me, that's probably the most one-dimensional way to make a sour. It's just not a complex tartness. So I recommend against doing that. So once again, to recap, just gonna be uh, using traditional Philly sour yeast fermented at about 68 Fahrenheit. It should drop the pH of the beer down to about 3.5 once it finishes its fermentation within a few weeks. At that point, we'll go ahead, we'll keg the beer. Anyway, guys, I'm very, very excited to see how this goes. Uh, I'm sorry you have to sit through my insufferable funds, but it's a lot of fun. So I'll see you guys in a few weeks. Until then, cheers. So fermentation for the Goza went quite well. Initially, I started everything out at 68 Fahrenheit and let it ferment like that for about a week. After taking samples, testing the pH, and testing the gravity, I found that it really wasn't hitting that final gravity that it was supposed to. So I ramped the temperature up to 80 Fahrenheit and let it continue the fermentation for another week at 80 Fahrenheit until it reached an appropriately dry final gravity of 1009, which was actually right on target. I also measured the pH uh, before carbonating and found it to be shockingly low at like 3.1. A pH of 3.1 not only is exceptionally sour, but also is below what Philly Sour is supposed to be capable of dropping the pH to. So I don't really trust that measurement. That being said, I calibrated my pH meter twice and measured twice and found it to be 3.1 both times. Maybe there was a bit more lactic acid produced than uh, Lalaman says is capable of. Perhaps also the salt cuts through the acid quite a bit and uh, keeps it from being excessively sour, but 3.1 measured pH is pretty intense. Still tasted absolutely fantastic. So I went ahead, packaged it up, force carbonated to about three volumes of CO2, and uh, we are ready to serve it right away. So the beer is called Margaritaville, and it comes in at 4% ABV and only 11 IBUs. For the appearance of the beer, it is an absolutely gorgeous looking, very, very pale straw color, slightly hazy, not opaque, but just slightly hazy. Looks more like a vice beer than anything else. It also pours with an absolutely stunning head. Um, that's a 50% wheat malt contribution right there. It is uh, such a well-structured head that it extends far up and above the glass, holds its structure and lasts forever. The head on this beer straight up looks like whipped cream. It's fantastic. All right, so let's go in for aroma. So right off the bat, I get a ton of lime and coriander. I get kind of like that uh, slightly tart tang, and I think I get a little bit of the salt. But I mean, it smells like a goza straight up. I think I'm actually getting a lot of coriander in this. But definitely got some citrus notes. Get, definitely got that lime. It's coming through very strongly on that aroma. Like it just smells super refreshing. It just smells like it's about to be the most thirst quenching beer you're about to drink. <laughs> and yeah, I would absolutely say that this definitely hits that target of uh, being very much like a margarita in terms of aroma. So let's go in for mouthfeel now and see how that's doing. Wow. That is dry. <laughs> That is, that is a very, very dry mouthfeel, um, which is, I think, the way it's supposed to be. But you kind of get a little bit of softness, a little bit of uh, creaminess in there from the wheat. Uh, that really, that really hits the spot. Well, I also carbonated this to a very, very high level. That's something you're traditionally gonna do with a Goza and with any German wheat beer, to be honest. Um, and it is super refreshing that way. You get that dryness, you get that high carbonation, but you still get the soft character of the wheat. It is a fantastic mouthfeel. Um, really just, uh, yeah, just absolutely hits the spot. The tartness sour component of this really does hit you kind of like right back here too. So you gotta get that little bit of an effect uh, as well from just the acidity in general. That also does impact the mouthfeel. All right, now let's go in for the most important part, flavor. This is absolutely perfect for this time of year. Right now, it is like 90 degrees out, 90% humidity. It is a very hot day for New England, 
and it is absolutely hitting the spot. This is nice and cold right now. You can see the level of condensation on the glass. It's ridiculous. Uh, let's, let's break down the flavor here though, because this is an exceptionally drinkable beer and has a lot of flavor to it as well. So right away, getting a lot of tartness, getting a lot of acidity. Um, this is a, on paper, relatively sour beer, um, like aggressively so, if you trust the pH. That being said, um, the tartness that I'm getting really isn't all that aggressive overall. And I think maybe the salt is cutting that and maybe my pH measurements are not quite accurate. The first thing I'm getting is that sour bite. So you're getting it kind of back here in the throat a little bit. It's pleasant, it's not aggressive, it doesn't get in the way of everything else. It really complements the whole point behind this drink. And uh, really also just, uh, it hits the spot in a very special way when combined with the saltiness, which is the next thing that you get. That lactic acid sourness really combines very well with the salt um, and the lime flavor. It just really, it hits it very much similar to drinking straight up sour mix for a margarita. The salty flavor is very prominent in this. Um, and it really does have this kind of Gatorade-like thirst quenching effect. I don't quite know how to explain it to you, but this is just absurdly refreshing. <laughs> So we got salt, we got lime, we definitely have coriander, and uh, we got the acidity to back it all up. What else do we get? There's definitely that kind of infamous red apple note that you get from Philly Sour as well, um, which it blends relatively well, to be honest with you. It, it kind of comes through a bit more like a strawberry, to me at least, but um, if I'm hunting for apple, I can definitely find it. But it's absolutely delicious. I mean, 4%, super highly carbonated, super refreshing. Like, you cannot beat this beer for this kind of weather. I'm not really getting much, if any, maltiness in this. If there's any contribution from it, it's at the very, very end with a little bit of a soft kind of pie crust character uh, coming through with the wheat malt. Uh, but that's really it. Uh, there's not really anything else going on in terms of uh, malt flavor. And I think the hops really have blended perfectly into the lime characteristic because I can't really pick anything out as, uh, as far as hops go. Motueka is notoriously very strong with the lime and I think that blended perfectly in as I designed it to. So that's kind of a big win. So now we'll talk about kind of the uh, breakdown of the acidity on this. This is my first time having uh, used Philly Sour. A lot of folks say it is a relatively one dimensional sour character and I do really completely agree with that. It's not like a kettle sour where you have multiple kinds of bacteria producing different kinds of acid in different concentrations. And it's also not a traditional long term uh, wild fermented or spontaneously fermented ale like a lambic or a gooza, it's not gonna be nearly that level of complexity. Um, and as long as you understand that and target just a simple basic sourness to complement something like this, then it works perfectly for this. Knowing what I know about sour beer production, this is far and away the easiest, simplest way to make a sour of any kind. But one thing to be aware of too, is that your lactic acid production is gonna be very dependent on your fermentation temperature, your pitch rate, and the amount of simple sugars involved. Because I mashed this so low and really maximized the fermentability of the wort, I got a lot of actual lactic acid production out of it, which is good without adding any dextrose. But one common thing I've seen people say is you might want to add a pound or so of dextrose into your uh, wort basically to facilitate that lactic acid production for this yeast. It also likes to be very hot. Um, I know I recommended initially that I was gonna uh, ferment this one at 65, but I ramped it all the way up to 80 to get it to actually finish. And I think that was really the way it should have been done from the beginning. As far as potential improvements on this one go, I think the only thing I can really think of here is the salt content. Um, so it is at the upper level of what is recommended for a five gallon batch of Goza. And depending on your palate and your sensitivity to saltiness and whether or not you like that character, uh, especially in a beer like this, it's gonna determine how much you wanna add. For me, this is really pushing it. Um, I would probably dial back the salt addition by about 25% or 30% maybe. Um, just to get it a little bit more balanced character, let that sourness shine through more, get more of that lime character in there. The second thing I'd do is probably add actually more of the uh, orange and coriander contribution into the final uh, boil addition there. The lime character is on point. That is, that is very easy to pick out here. It is a perfect level of lime character, but I think it needs more of uh, generic uh, complexity in the citrus character. Another cool thing you could do with this maybe is uh, if you really wanna go hardcore leaning into that margarita vibe, maybe throw a little bit of tequila soaked oak chips in there for some reposado character or um, 
you know, just maybe throw a little bit of tequila into the actual uh, mix and bump the ABV up. You really can do whatever you want with this type of thing. I mean, Goza is really making a comeback as a very creative style. Um, and I certainly had a lot of fun with this. This is a fantastic beer. It is a super easy thing to drink and I'm very happy I have it on tap. This five gallon batch is gonna go super fast. So let me know what your thoughts are about brewing with Philly Sour. Let me know what your thoughts are on this particular recipe. Have you made a Goza like this, a similar one, a different one, maybe identically almost to this one? Let me know how it goes for you if you brew this yourself. But anyway, guys, thank you for watching. And uh, if you learned something and appreciated it, please hit that like button. Don't forget to do that before you leave. And subscribe if you haven't already. Comment down below with your thoughts and experiences on everything. If you wanna help support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one from my merchandise store. I got this and plenty of other designs down there that that's in the description box. You can also find a Patreon link down there. My Patreon supporters are huge, huge influencers in helping make this channel a better place, both in terms of production and in quality overall. So I have a big thank you uh, to give to you guys for helping support this channel as much as you do. There's also a uh, channel memberships option and there's the super thanks button if you feel inclined to hit either of those. Both of those things help me out quite a bit. There's also an Amazon store where you can find everything that I use to brew with that's on Amazon. And you can also find the production side of things as well if you're curious about how things are made, um, how things are filmed, recorded, etc, etc. Go check it out when you got some time. If you want to follow me on more than just YouTube and you want to see what's coming to the channel in the future, please check out my Instagram and my Facebook at The Apartment Brewer uh, on both platforms. I do generally post the same things to both platforms, so one or the other or both. Follow me there for some more frequent content updates. Anyway guys, if you're still watching, Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of the video. It means a lot to me that you're still here because I put a lot of work into these videos and I have so much fun sharing my beers with you guys virtually. So thank you for being here. This was actually a full pint. It drinks so easy. I'm gonna probably grab another pint and uh, continue having a great Friday afternoon. So this one goes out to you guys. Thank you so much for being here. And until the next one, cheers.